All right. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Um, for those of you that don't know, my name is Lynn Nguyen. I am the Young Adult Librarian at Chinatown Branch Library. Uh, we are here today with Jessica Levy. She's my co-host from Palisades Branch. Yay! And we are so excited to have all of you here for our weekly virtual career day series where we introduce amazing careers to you. Today we have two guest speakers from the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles and Seattle Children's Hospital. We would like to extend our deepest thanks to all of you for being here with us today. Our guest speakers, the Library Foundation, the Friends of the Ch and the Friends of the Chinatown Branch Library for their generous support. Uh, before we begin, I would like to go over some housekeeping rules. Your microphones are already muted um, and you do not need to have your videos turned on. Recording is in progress. If you wish to, have to ask questions at any time during the program, please do feel free to type that into the chat box and we'll try our best to ask that question for you during uh, our Q&A. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed today's career day and please remember to complete our very short survey at the end of the program. We'll be linking that in the chat box. So with that being said, um, if you all have your chat box open, the popcorn question for today is, when the COVID vaccine does come out, do you think it's a good idea to get it? Will you be getting the vaccine? You could type in yes or no into the chat box. All right. Yes, lots of yeses. Okay, couple of notes. That's okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, yes. All right. A lot of, lot of different, lot of different answers, and that's totally fine. Um, I know that uh, our host, our, our guest speaker here, Sahar, um, who's a pediatrician at Seattle Children's Hospital, she will be speaking more about that. Um, during her talk. So um, I'm going to start off the program with my friend here, Sarah Bilby, who is a registered nurse at the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. So hi, Sarah. How are you doing? Hey, Lynn. I'm great. <laughs> great, great. So Sarah, um, can you please tell everybody here what your job title is, uh, what you do, and uh, possibly, uh, you know, what your day-to-day -day job looks like at the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, a, thanks so much for inviting me, having me. Um, I am a registered nurse at the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. Um, and I am part of a really cool team within the hospital um, called the float team. And so my team is a team of nurses that is, we're, we're trained across um, a bunch of different units and a bunch of different specialties. And so if a particular unit is short staffed that day or has some sort of increased need or increased patient acuity, they will send one of us to that unit to help, um, help out their staffing and to act as a nurse um, on that floor for a day. And so that means my day-to-day -day actually looks very different day-to-day. -day. Um, on one day, I could be on the cardiac unit. On the next day, I could be in the emergency room. And the next day, I could be on the oncology um, cancer units, uh, which has been, I've been in this job for about two years now, and it's been, it's been really cool. It's been a really incredible learning opportunity, um, providing a lot of different uh, patient populations and a lot of different experiences and uh, opportunities to learn new skills. Very cool. Can you tell us about why did you decide to become a registered nurse? What inspired you? And in particular, why did you choose to work with children? Yeah, so um, my like my nursing story begins back when I was in high school. I was a junior in high school, 16 years old, and I was in a really bad car accident. Um, that wasn't my fault. We were rear-ended um, in a really small car, um, and I spent about I spent five weeks in the hospital. It was not a fun time. Um, had to school totally like derailed what I thought I was going to be doing with my life. Um, and in those weeks in the hospital, I really got to know a lot of my nurses, um, and nurse practice, um, and realized that they were totally the backbone, the heart and soul of my experience, um, because they were the ones who were there with me for such a long time throughout the day. Um, and I thought it was so cool that they could have such an impact on my experience. Um, and so that's kind of what set off my, my desire to pursue nursing, to kind of give back to that community 
also be able to be that person for somebody else to um, impact their life and their well-being in such a cool, intimate way um, in a setting that is and painful and wants to be in the hospital. Um, and I actually, I, ch I chose pediatrics because I really wanted to work um, in the hospital where I was a patient. Um, and so that was, that was really cool. I actually, that was my first nursing job back. I'm from Texas. It was in uh, the Children's Hospital in Austin. And I uh, work with a lot of the same um, doctors and nurse practitioners who actually like literally put me back together. Um, and so it was a really cool full story uh experience i mean and then you know this the day-to-day -day job wasn't always like rainbows and sparkles but it was it was definitely cool to be able to um literally be in in the the shoes of the nurses that had taken care of me which was cool wow i'm so glad i'm sure we're also glad that you're okay and that you're here with us today um wow that's amazing so um you know was it hard to become a nurse like what was can you walk us through your, um, you know, educational path on like after high school? Sure, of course. Um, the, I went to the University of Virginia and the University of Virginia is a four year nursing program. And so I applied directly um, from high school into that program, which I got really lucky. I knew I wanted to be a nurse right out of high school, which I was not the case for a lot of people. Um, and I applied directly into the nursing school. Um, I didn't have to do years of prereqs or um, apply separate program down the line. Um, and so I got really lucky. I was able to finish in four years, um, any extra semesters. Um, and nursing and nursing school is very time consuming, you know, because instead of, you know, your classes that take you know, an hour and a half every day, you'll have clinicals that are legitimately 12 hours, you know, eight or 12 hour shifts in the hospital, um, which is, which is crucial to um, learning how to be a nurse is just being on the floor and doing it. Um, but it, it definitely is, it's, it definitely will, will consume your life, um, just purely time wise. Um, I know there are a lot of other programs that if you don't, ex you know, if you're not a uh, like jump into a four-year program right out of high school or if you don't have like the time or the money for that um or any it's anywhere from a one-year accelerated program to two-year master's programs um bachelor's programs it's kind of it's if you want to get into nursing there is definitely a program that would fit um whatever time frame and kind of intensity level that you're looking for um, I, and I will say a lot, most hospitals are now wanting bachelor degrees for their nurses. Um, and so uh, a lot of, I would say, if you are looking into to going to nursing school, keep an eye out for those programs because that definitely makes uh, more applicant for, for jobs. That's really good to know. So a bachelor program for, for nursing. Okay, um, and when you were in college going to nursing school, what would you say? Um, Besides the clinicals, like what what were the what was the most challenging part um, as a registered nurse and uh, the most rewarding part? Yeah, um, in nursing school, I would say the most challenging part I would say for me was this one class, pharmacology was not. I definitely should never be a pharmacist because uh, that you know just memorization of all of those drugs. Um, was was a challenge for me but um uh and I would say again just the the hours of nursing school in that you know you have you have your normal classes and you have your normal exams in college which are consuming enough but then on top of that you have these long days that are just taken up by um by by your clinical rotations um that being said in college at least um and I mean, and to today working as a nurse, I mean, the clinical rotations, being on the floor, being there with families, um, I mean, that's, that's like the most rewarding thing, right? Knowing that, that you are able to help somebody in a practical way, you know, by literally giving them, helping them get up, walk around, um, you know, organizing their therapies, coordinating their home care, things like that, that, um, 
that are very practical, you know, practical interventions. Um, but then also just knowing that you yourself as a person are there with this other individual as a person. And that connection, I think is really, is like really incredible. And knowing that you connect with this other person and can make a difference in their life at like from a person to person uh, standpoint is I think really cool. Wonderful. Um, for all of our teens out there that um, that are interested in becoming a nurse or learning more about nursing, what kind of skills do you think is important for them to have in order to become a nurse like yourself? Yeah. Um, I mean, <laughs> I definitely want to emphasize you do not have to have any inherent skills to become a nurse. You go to nursing school for that reason. You don't have to be, uh, you know, born to be a nurse. Um, if you, if you want to be a nurse. I think, I think empathy and communication are both really important qualities, I think just for people to have in general as people. But uh, I think especially in nursing to be able to, um, to be able to understand where not only your patients are coming from, but where the rest of the team is also coming from, from where the physicians are coming from and the respiratory therapists and the physical therapists and the case managers um, and being able to communicate really effectively with, um, with those teams and with your patients. Um, I think a, a lot of care can be missed if, if, you, um, if you are unwilling or uh, if, if you don't like interpersonal communication. I think that's a huge piece of, um, of nursing and I think I think anyone would say like in healthcare in general. Um, and then <laughs> I think flexibility as well, because you, your day never looks the same. Your day will be full of stuff that is technically not in your job description, but all of a sudden now you're having to deal with like, okay, what do I do about the turtle that the patient brought into their room? And like, oh no, like you don't have a ride home and, and oh wait, you don't have any access to care outpatient. and what am I going to do about this thing that I've never seen? And so it's, it's kind of a, a flexibility and uh, willingness to kind of take whatever comes, um, which can be very exciting, very interesting, or really exhausting if you're just not in the mood to, to um, deal with a turtle in the patient's room. Okay. <laughs> would, you be, would you be able to tell us more about like stories? Like, can you tell us about a a really great story uh, that you've experienced at the children's hospital and then maybe um, a challenge that one can expect if they do become a registered nurse? Yeah, sure, of course. Um, I, think, uh, I think one of the, who, maybe this story is like a little bit of both, um, but I, um, there's there's one patient in particular that I that I know very well. She comes to our hospital frequently um, due to a chronic this, um, and she um, is really she she has some developmental challenges and developmental um, needs not that are different from um, peers of her same age, um, and she she is challenging to work with because she gets very anxious. She's been to the hospital a lot. She knows what's coming. She doesn't want the IV. She doesn't want the medication. She's been baptized by how many times she's had to be hospitalized. Um, and one day I was working in the ER and, and she came in. And since I know her, I was able to, I knew, I knew what she needed. I knew that she needed our child life specialist. I knew that it, she wasn't a patient that you could kind of just force and say this is how we're going to do it and that's that um she's somebody that you you have to connect with and you have to talk to and and manage her anxiety um and it was really really um rewarding because we were able to give her care that was really effective really safe and was very respectful of um what she what she needed as a person um and that was like incredibly rewarding and now i see this patient in the hallways um, and she runs up to me and gives me a huge hug every time she sees me, which is, is so cool. And you don't get that with every patient. And she certainly is not running up to, um, every other, you know, every other person in the hallway. Um, and so knowing that I was able to provide her really, like really effective care in an emergency situation, um, on her own personal needs was, 
um, was uh, was really cool. Uh, something also challenging in regards to actually the same patient um, is watching how um, watching how we can only do so much as healthcare providers. Um, in that, if she she was unable to tolerate um, cardiac leads, the stickers that we put on patients' chests to monitor their heart rate and for any arrhythmias or um, problems with their heart rate. Um, and then an oxygen or a pulse oximeter, which measures the oxygen in the blood and it's a sticker on the finger. I mean, she was unable to tolerate those for a long period of time. And so we actually, we had to, we had to not give her a specific treatment that would have um, improved her prognosis for her particular disease process. Um, and that's really hard. And her parents live really far away. And so their access to receiving consistent care is um, a little fractured. Um, and so it's those, it's those situations that are really, that are really challenging and really heartbreaking because you want to do so much, but it takes, it, it sometimes there's just only so much, um, so, you know, so much you can do on your, you know, on your daily basis. And that's not saying that there are not like careers in like public health and outpatient care and all things, right, that could bridge those gaps. But in terms of my my day-to-day -day experience, I think those are the most challenging ones where I, I recognize where my reach, like where my impact and where my, um, where my help mm -hmm. ends. Wow. You have like such a, you know, you're so patient and such a great personality from what I do know. So I'm sure that, you know, the patients here really do gain a lot from you. Um, you know, and now that we, we are, of course, we're in the, in the middle of this pandemic and how has it affected your job um, before then? And then now that, uh, you know, the hospitals, uh, what, what has changed about your job? Yeah, um, so for, um, knock on wood, for the pediatric uh, population, um, COVID, in my experience, COVID has not, um, it has not ravaged the pediatric patient population as much as it has an older adult population. Um, and so for, for our hospital, we actually, we didn't see an increase in patients, we saw a decrease in patients because of social distancing and because of delayed um, elective procedures, we're not seeing as many kids, or for up until now, I don't want to speak into the future, but um, we we saw less kids getting sick because they're staying home, because they're not with their friends, because they're not wiping snot on each other um, and getting each other sick. And so um, it's been really interesting. Also, our hospital has had to pivot a little bit because um, we have to open, we had to open a COVID testing site at our hospital um, to make sure that staff would be able to get tested um, in a timely manner if they were if they were exposed to COVID or if they displayed symptoms of COVID. It, we also had to start screening people, which is part of the team that I'm on, um, where we check everyone's temperature as they come in and ask questions to make sure um, they're not symptomatic or they haven't had exposures and kind of the, the little details of what is an exposure, um, what you know what qualifies as a quarantine and what do you need to do from there um and so my job i actually don't work on the patient i work on the patient floors about 50 percent of the time and the other 50 percent of the time i doing the screening process and so my day-to-day -day definitely looks different i would rather be on the floors but um hopefully hopefully we can all be looking forward into uh kind of resolving this hopefully soon. But. Yeah, hopefully. Oh, wow. Um, does your organization or do you know if your um, job position, like are there any internship opportunities or volunteer opportunities that high school students or college students can take advantage of? I know at children, the Children's Hospital, we um, we do, we love volunteers. Oh my gosh. I, so many times I have had a fussy baby and while I'm running around doing something, I, a volunteer will come up and just hold the fussy baby for me. And oh my gosh, that is a <laughs> lifesaver. Um, but, and so we definitely your opportunities um, it, as much as uh, helping patients walk from their, from the front desk to their outpatient appointment. Cause we have a huge hospital. Um, and so it gets really confusing. 
um, you, you can do that. We have a book program where volunteers will come around and like deliver books or toys to kids. Um, so there are definitely volunteering opportunities. Um, in terms of internships, I know, I don't think CHLA does nursing internships. Um, but if you, I believe upon high school graduation, you are eligible to be a care partner, which um, is kind of the, and I would recommend as the entry into um, a nursing career. That's what I did. It's you, you work on the floors alongside the physicians and the nurses um, and, and you, but you don't do um, uh, licensed care. So you help patients with baths, you help them eat, you help them um, kind of move around if they need to walk. You can, um, you take their vitals. So you get a lot of patient care and a lot of patient interaction um, to even just see if you love environment as well as and have an in to a, a job if your if your unit needs a nurse upon completion of nursing school. Um, so I both while it's not an internship, uh, that does mean you get paid for it because it is a job. That's great. That's good to know. Um, do you have any resources that you could recommend to our audience or anything that you found helpful when you were on your path to nursing school? Hmm. I think, honestly, in my path through nursing school, it is it much of your life that. Oh, there she's getting cut off. Oh no. All right, I do apologize everybody. It seems like we do have technical difficulties um, with Sarah here, so. Uh, let me go ahead and do this. We'll wait till she comes back. Um, Jessica, do you want to, I think while we figure out what's going on with uh, Sarah, do you just want to go ahead and um, start with Sahar and then we can come oh. back to Sarah when she comes back? Yeah. yeah, sorry about that, everybody. Okay, well, this is an abrupt shift, but <laughs> thanks to sorry. everyone for, we're used to unusual times, right? So. We'll welcome Sarah back when she gets in. Well, I want to thank Sahar Ruhulamini, Dr. Ruhulamini, for taking the time to be here with us today. She is coming to us from Seattle. However, she is no stranger to LA. Um, Sahar and I have known each other since we were 13, and she's, I knew her pre pre med, and she's um, very familiar with the San Fernando Valley lifestyle as well. So let me welcome Sahar today. And Sahar, can you start by telling us uh, what your job is and where you work? Yeah, thanks, Jess. Thanks for having me here. Um, it's wonderful to be in this virtual space with you all. Um, and hopefully I can provide information that you need and reassurance that if you're interested in a career in healthcare, it is absolutely something you should pursue and that there's support um, for you in it. So I am a pediatrician. I'm a pediatric hospitalist, which means I spend all of my time um, in the hospital. Um, so uh, about one week a month, um, I have uh, time on service, which means I work in our children's hospital and no two days are the same, really. Um, basically, patients who need to be hospitalized, but they're not um, super sick, meaning they're not in the ICUs, um, come onto my service. And um, Basically, we provide them the care that they need, um, and it allows me to have um, this relatively short period. Most patients are not in the hospital um, any more than a week. Um, often, it's just a matter of a few days, but I get to have this intense short-term um, relationship um, and continuity with patients and families and try to support them through uh, what is often the most stressful time of their lives. And so I really like that. Um, I like being there um, with perfect strangers and trying to support them through an experience like that um, to help their children um, feel better. And um, right now my job is actually really not mostly seeing patients. So um, a big chunk of my time, the other three weeks of the month, I spend doing a mix of education. So um, you go to college and then you go to medical school. And then after medical school, you have to have a period where you're um, a resident. And that basically means that you are a doctor, you get to, you know, 
right? Um, orders and prescriptions and prescribed medicines, all of that, um, but you're being supervised um, by someone like me. And so I am one of the associate directors of our pediatric residency program. And so we have 125 brilliant, amazing, diverse um, young doctors who spent three years with us in residency. And um, uh, we determine the things that they learn, how they learn them. Um, we work with all the hospitals in our region. So one cool thing about um, Seattle Children's Hospital where I work is that uh, we are the only referral center, specialty center for kids in a five state region. Um, so that's Washington, Wyoming, Alaska, Montana, and Idaho. So we um, take care of patients and families from really a huge part of the country. When you think of Alaska, it's landmass alone extends from the West Coast to the East coast of the lower 48. Um, and so uh, it's exciting to think about the different educational needs for young doctors um, in that region. I do a little bit of research um, specifically on um, infections in, in young babies. Um, and then I do something called quality improvement or QI, which is um, really looking at uh, the system of healthcare um, and how we can improve things upstream. Um, so uh, before medical school, I went to um, school for, for public health and that really provided me a big picture of how systems work um, so that when someone enters the hospital, do we already have things in place to make sure they get the care they need and that it happens on time um, as opposed to every single time trying to reinvent the wheel and see you know, what we need to do. So improving processes. So that's like a big overview of my job. <laughs> wow, that sounds like a lot. Um, you kind of touched on your various educational experiences, but can you walk us back? So when you were a teenager, were you already, did you have your heart set on becoming a doctor? When did that start for you? And then did you kind of have a traditional path and what were, can you tell us about your schooling experiences? Yeah, well, as you know, Jess, um, my parents were pretty certain that I would be going into medicine. Um, and, you know, I think it, it, that idea was always there. Um, when I went to college, I um, was lucky enough to study abroad um, and I did a semester in Zimbabwe. Um, and while I was there, I became really interested in public health. Um, so basically like, you know, the, not just, you know, the individual who may have a condition, but, you know, the sort of context that they live in. Um, what is their housing like? What kind of, um, income do they have? What is the health of their family members? Do they have responsibilities um, to take care of other family members? Um, what is their access to education? So all of these things, like the totality of someone's life and how all of that comes together to affect uh, their health became really interesting for me. So um, after college, I did a master's in public health and I thought I was gonna really just launch into a career in public health. But what I realized is I really missed the individual stories. I missed that one-on-one -on -one contact and Sarah was talking about this too, um, of getting to know people, um, getting to know someone new um, every time you have a, a clinical shift. Um, and um, that drew me back to medicine. And so after the master's in public health, I went to medical school um, and you can, and so I'm a medical doctor. Some go to osteopathic school and they become DOs um, and the training for all intents and purposes is pretty much equivalent. Um, and so after medical school, I entered um, pediatric residency for three years. And then finally, I was done with training. <laughs> um, and so for just under a decade now, um, I've been um, a supervising doctor for hospital teams. And what in that time have been some of the highlights or joys of your jobs? You know, I think um, being able to be challenged um, on the regular and think like, okay, what, you know, what is going on medically, but also being challenged in terms of like, what is my role as someone who has, um, has some say in what happens? What is my role in advocating for patients? And so, um, you know, asthma, for example, is one of the top uh, two or three reasons why um, children are hospitalized in this country. And it is a very serious diagnosis. And if you're hospitalized, that means that, um, our health system needs to do a better job of supporting you um, so that you don't have these flares of your asthma and get hospitalized. And it's one thing to do the medicine part of it. You know, we give the 
uh, medicine to open up your lungs and oxygen if needed, all that stuff. But one thing that I found very powerful, particularly in our hospital system that looks at, again, those upstream things that impact people's lives is, um, can we get a public health nurse to come out and do a home assessment to look at triggers in the environment that may make asthma worse? Um, some of uh, the patients that I take care of um, know that there are things in their environment, but they have, for example, housing situations where um, they are not able to get the repairs needed um, to uh, make those asthma triggers better, make them go away. Um, so can we partner with our medical legal program, a group of wonderful attorneys to advocate, to write letters to landlords, um, to see if there's funding available. Um, as Sarah was saying, it can be really, hard sometimes not being able to fix all the things, but um, what I find really rewarding is that um, as, a, as a physician, as a doctor, um, people do listen when we speak up. Um, at least some of the time. <laughs> and, um, and so we have that ability to really advocate um, so that hopefully we can prevent people from needing to come into the hospital. Um, so I've I, I love that. Um, and I love the challenges that, that presents and really being able to partner with families to say, okay, tell me you're, you're in the hospital only a short amount of time, thankfully. Tell me what we can do to make being at home better, easier. Um, who can we link you to? Um, so I like that a lot. Cool. Thank you. Um, I know, I'm sure most of our audience knows that the path to becoming a medical doctor is arduous. Um, it requires lots of schooling. But is there anything you want to share? What what kind of qualities, maybe things that you can't learn necessarily in school, but what what should someone consider if they want to pursue being a doctor? Um, do you have any tips or resources you want to share with us? Well, I'll be honest that I think the the process and all the hurdles. Um, uh, that are currently in place in our medical education system are really misguided and we just have had hundreds of years of, of this. Um, and I think um, there's a lot of work and discussion to really uh, change the way that we think about medical education. So um, if you if you love organic chemistry, if you love science, that's a wonderful reason to enter medicine. You should not feel like you know, you have to be a whiz at OCHEM or physics or calculus or any of the prerequisites. You shouldn't feel like, oh, I have to take, you know, I have to do really well on the standardized test because we know based on really good studies that how you do uh, on a standardized test like the MCAT has nothing to do with how good of a doctor you are, um, how often you make accurate diagnoses, how much your patients appreciate you, how effectively you communicate. So um, part of my role as a medical educator is to really uh, think about the ways that we evaluate medical students applying to our residency and be a little bit more um, holistic. I think as with so many things, if you're going to pursue medical training, it's important to be open to failure. We all fail, whether that's failing a test or um, uh, messing up when, you know, uh, trying to take care of a patient. We, we all fail. I have, I have failed um, on multiple occasions. And the key is not, you know, beating yourself up and saying, oh, you know, I didn't, I didn't succeed here. I'm not made for this. It's saying, okay, this feels really crummy. It feels really bad to fail, but what can I learn from it? How can I have a, what we, you know, what many people call the growth mindset. Um, so how can I make lemonade from this um, and learn from it and do better and, and make sure that it doesn't happen again? Thanks. Um, so I just, if you don't mind shifting over to uh, what has it been like working in the hospital since uh, the pandemic began and in particular, how is, you know, there's been a lot of talk now about going into here in California, a third wave or the country overall, um, how that there's staff, maybe fatigue, especially from nursing staff or from hospital staff. What are your thoughts on this? What has your experience been like? Yeah, I can tell you it's been really scary. And I agree with Sarah in pediatrics, thankfully we have not had, um, you know, for reasons that we don't quite understand yet, um, kids are thankfully spared um, uh, the um, severe 
COVID illnesses that adults have. But I can tell you, even at a children's hospital, it's been frightening. And there is not a single day since um, mid-February, because Seattle was the first hot spot um, in the US, that I haven't woken up with um, a sense of uncertainty and dread. Um, and that's just been compounded, I guess, by all the other things that lead to uncertainty, uncertainty and dread in 2020. But you know, um, thinking about, well, will our pediatric residents who haven't taken care of adult patients um, in a while be asked to go to the adult hospitals that they're that are surging um, and be placed in that position? Will I um, be asked to do that? And and my own nervousness about you know. Uh, taking care of adults when I haven't done that in um, over a decade, uh, thinking about um, getting sick at the hospital. So we had, um, as did everyone, um, shortages in personal pr protective equipment. So the masks and face shields and gloves, you know, the, um, the N95 masks that are really like the gold standard, um, they are under lock and key. Um, and uh, I couldn't get one right now in the hospital um, no matter what. And, and so that's, that's the situation that we're facing. Um, and like Sarah was saying, you know, the, the children have been relatively spared. Um, we do have a special COVID unit um, and we usually have one or two patients. Now we have a few more um, on any given day in that unit. Um, and so we follow all the protocols and uh, that have the special gear to protect them and protect ourselves. But, you know, we um, right now in Washington state, a lot of the hospitals, especially on the Eastern side of the state um, can't take care of the patients who are coming there. And it's not because they're necessarily so many patients, but because staff are getting sick. And throughout this entire pandemic, we've had um, more staff getting sick um, with COVID than actual patients. And so I think about that a lot. Um, you know, are we going to be able to meet the needs of our entire five state region at our hospital if we don't have the staff, whether that's um, physicians, nurses, therapists, uh, pharmacists, you know, just the unit clerks, everyone. Um, so it is really frightening. And I think like everyone else, uh, me and my colleagues are exhausted. We wish that we could get together with friends and family, but it is also really hard to see people writing this off because literally going to work every day is a calculation of like, okay, you know, uh, can I sit in this chair um, and wipe it off enough? Um, am I going to um, bring something home on the sole of my shoe or on my clothes? Um, you know, I just think about coming home and our two-year-old, uh, if he sees me, he just wants to jump into my arms and I just have to like, despite his screams, run upstairs, uh, throw all my clothes. Um, into the washer, shower completely. I mean, our, our, our lives have changed in ways um, uh, big and small as healthcare workers. And so um, it is no joke, um, even being, I guess, less uh, on the front lines of COVID in pediatrics. And we've all seen that um, mental health has become an, another even bigger concern for everyone and especially healthcare workers, as you're describing that kind of stress of your own child wanting to just give jump on you and give you a big hug and kiss when you come home from work and having to push them away creates tension for both of you. So how, how do you cope with that stress? Yeah, well, you know, I think um, it always helps to, uh, you know, um, and one other thing too, I think, which everyone is experiencing is that now that everything's moved to Zoom and virtual meetings, it just seems like now there are more hours <laughs> of virtual meetings, which is not helpful. So I think being really intentional about protecting time um, and, you know, trying to go for a walk, um, trying to, you know, just like uh, take a moment to text someone to say you're thinking about them. Um, one of our former residents, um, two of them actually uh, work in um, Chinle, Arizona, um, at Indian Health uh, uh, Hospital there. Um, and, you know, COVID-19 has ravaged um, indigenous populations and it has been a huge problem in the Navajo Nation, but we now have been texting back and forth, sending pictures of like, you know, um, just something beautiful that we've seen during the day, commiserating, um, you know, she is a pediatrician and now she has to see adult patients who have 
very complex problems and she is an incredible doctor. Um, but, you know, just having an outlet for that stress with someone who would understand. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the toll, a lot of healthcare and what brings us to healthcare is this beautiful value of altruism, right? Like people are going through the worst time in their lives. They're having a health crisis. We have to be above that and put their needs above ours. And that is absolutely what centers us in healthcare. Um, but it's very hard when you are running on empty, trying to maintain that. And you see people not taking this global pandemic that has now killed a quarter of a, of a million people in our country alone, um, just not taking it seriously. And so I don't think, yeah, I, I, uh, I think so peer support is really helpful. Um, knowing when to turn off the news can be helpful. Um, and then just really figuring out, um, you know, ways to advocate at the community um, level and at the state and national levels, if you have that opportunity um, to get the word out about how serious this is. And to, to bring that back to the question we asked at the start of today's session about the COVID vaccine. So I just want to bring up a, a poll, one of the many polls that it was done recently suggested that um, they polled healthcare workers and in the poll, 60% of the doctors polled surveyed said that they would definitely get the COVID vaccine when it was once it was approved and available. Um, of nurses, 40% said that they would get the COVID vaccine. And we know um, from other polls, I don't have specific figures, but amongst the rest of us, non-medical professionals, I'm sure the percentage who are rushing, going to rush out and get the vaccine are is much lower. So as a doctor, someone grounded in science, can you tell us your thoughts about the COVID vaccine? There's so much myths and disinformation out there. Um, what are you, and what are you basing your judgments on? Yeah, I'm basing my judgments and assessments on the science and uh, non-political experts who have been doing this far before COVID was even a thing. Um, and I think what's so hard is that we are in such a divided society with so much misinformation on all sides um, and so much speculation that's not based in fact, it's not based in calm, critical assessment um, of science that um, even people who are medically trained are feeling a little uneasy, um, trusting what they hear. Um, so it is still very early days for the vaccines, but it is incredibly reassuring that now two separate ones um, have 95% uh, um, or greater um, efficacy. Um, and I, I know that our state is coming up with a plan to figure out, you know, who would be the first among healthcare workers to get the vaccine. Um, our hospital uh, requires flu vaccine for everyone every single year. I don't think they will require the COVID vaccine. And I think that's based on really just this being early days, but I will most certainly um, get the vaccine. Um, the most recent data I saw was that in terms of the side effects, 2% developed um, headaches um, and 4% developed fatigue. And given what we know about COVID, the illness, um, that's uh, I, I will take those vaccine side effects if I'm in the 2 to 4% that experienced that versus getting COVID um, potentially uh, decimating the health of people in my household, including my 70 and 80 year old um, in-laws who live with us, um, putting my own health at risk, putting my coworkers um, in the hospital at risk, and then potentially having sequelae, which we're learning more about. So side effects um, that last for months and months um, after the illness. To me, it, it is a no brainer, but I appreciate the popcorn poll that happened in the, um, at, at the top of the hour um, and that there, you know, uh, nothing is a given and it's very hard to know which sources of information are the right ones. Um, that's why it's important for us as a healthcare system and healthcare um, personnel to, to have those conversations um, and to, to provide uh, what we know scientifically. The process that the vaccines have gone through is the same as other processes. So someone mentioned that the actual um, the basis of it is different. This uses mRNA um, and uh, the, the two different vaccines both use that mechanism. Um, 
but uh, in terms of the amount of data, uh, the safety that they have to um, prove, all of those have, have been met and they're marching along in that process. Um, we're getting results sooner because we're in a pandemic. Um, normally it would be months or years before a vaccine would you know, come to um, market like this, but they are going to continue to collect data again per that standard process and it's going to be vetted by experts um, who are not politicians um, to see if it continues to be um, as effective as, as initially um, studied. Well, thank you for that. And if anyone else has any questions about that or anything else regarding today or guest speakers, feel free to start typing them in the chat. Um, Sahar, would you, to close it up, would, if you could turn back time and tell your teenage self, give yourself some words of wisdom, uh, what, what would that be? Um, well, you know me, I was a really wise teenager, so. <laughs> Um, Don is on this call too, and he knew me when I was a teen. Um, so, you know, I think I, I felt really um, torn because I was really into like um, uh, women's studies and uh, sort of like more like the social aspects, like the, you know, public health, social determinants of health type of thing. And I felt like I need to decide between like medicine and that. And you don't have to decide. I mean, a lot of the work that I do as a residency program director is around equity, diversity, and inclusion and the biases um, and uh, overt uh, racism and discrimination that our healthcare system um, has been a part of for hundreds of years, unfortunately, and really trying to dismantle a lot of that. And if I had known that, I think I would have felt a lot more confident um, and, and not uh, spent a lot of time, you know, perseverating on that. But you can you can make your career in what into what you want it to be. It does take a lot of steps and a lot of um, prerequisites, um, but it it is infinitely better um, now that I finished my training than I could have even imagined um, back when, you know, before I even started this whole process. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see a question here from uh, Malia. I have a few questions here. Um, Malia just asked, would you say having a mature mindset is a huge factor in your career? Um, I guess, I mean, have you I, always been mature? No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. And I think, um, and I know Malia, you had asked a question earlier too, that reminded me, um, for Sarah about the differences between nurse practitioner and uh, nurse and OB guide. So we can definitely go to that afterward. Um, thank you for asking this second question too. You know, I think, um, medical training certainly exposes you to the hardest parts of people's lives and you get a lot of perspective and it, it builds a maturity. Um, but, uh, I think, uh, doctors, uh, healthcare personnel, we grow and mature um, just like anybody else. And, you know, during medical training, your own life happens too. And that really matures you when you um, yourself or a family member on the are on the other side of the doctor patient encounter, and you are the patients and you have to wait several hours to talk to a doctor or you can't get a prescription refilled after three calls, um, just to name some, some common examples. Um, then you have a lot more empathy. You have a lot more maturity um, when you're back at work and trying to talk to someone who is just at wit's end. Um, so it comes with time, I would say. Thank you. Thank you. And Sarah, I know you got cut off earlier and welcome back. I know um, I wanted to ask you the last question, like what we asked Sahar. Um, if you can turn back time and give yourself a, a few words of advice or a, a, some advice for our teams, like what would you say? Um, this is, this is going to sound probably really cheesy, but I think, uh, to like really go for it in terms of, um, practice in terms of exposure, in terms of jumping into things familiar, I think, um, in nursing school. And then as I was starting out as a nurse, I wanted to stay, I, I, most, a lot of people do, you want to stay where it's comfortable because you're, you're dealing with kids and you're dealing with families. Um, but I think you have, if you have the opportunity to, to jump into a procedure or to 
take a patient that um, you might not be super familiar with, know that like there is support and there are resources around you, um, that it's not all on you. Um, and to just get yourself every, like every type of experience that you, that you can get and don't, don't stay where you're comfortable um, just because you feel like you need to be the expert. Thank you for that. Um, we have a question here from Alan Martinez. Alan asks, what classes must be taken to become a pediatrician? This is probably for you, Sahar. Yeah, so, um, you know, they're the pre-med requirements. And to be honest, I have not um, brushed up on them, but I think it's some number of um, science classes, like I think um, biology, chemistry, um, et cetera, that you take um, in college. And that could certainly be two year uh, or four year. Um, and then, uh, and, and those, I don't think they've changed probably in decades, if not centuries. Um, and uh, once you get to medical school, the first two years are really studying how the body works um, and studying how um, diseases develop. Um, and then the second two years, um, which I greatly enjoyed, uh, were actually the clinical rotation. So you get to basically um, go see what it's like to be an internal medicine doctor, a, a doctor for adults. You get to see what it's like to be an OBGYN, um, get to see what it's like to be a surgeon of different, um, different kinds. Um, and then based on that, you choose by your last or fourth year of medical school. Um, and for me, I tried to keep an open mind, um, but when I uh, went on my pediatrics rotation, it was a no brainer. I just saw the way people interacted and the amount of joy um, that there was um, uh, in, in daily work. And so I was like, these are my people, I'm going into pediatrics. It's wonderful. Uh... Let's see, during your time in the profession, have you seen a shift in attitudes in medicine? I think that's a great question. Because this can be for Sahar or Sarah. Sorry. Oh, Sahar. <laughs> <laughs> How good Sahar. Um, um, what do you mean, Jess? Have there been any like major attitude shifts amongst doctors, for example, in the last like 10 or even 15 years since when you were in med school? Yeah. I mean, I, the, um, we always say like, you know, medical knowledge only lasts about five years and then you, there's so much new medical knowledge coming out even every day. So that's, that's always been true. But I think, um, people are realizing that in this country, we put in so much money into our healthcare system, like roughly a fifth to a quarter of our, our entire um, nation's uh, income, yet we do not have good health. <laughs> in fact, our health um, in some ways is worse than countries that have far less income. And so I think there's actual um, more meaningful work um, about why that is about like the bigger picture of people's health. Um, and in my area, my special interest in medical education, especially once folks have gotten their um, degree and are in training, um, we are focusing much more on equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, and what that means is starting from the moment someone is in junior high, high school, even earlier, who may be just interested, curious about what a healthcare career is like and um, getting them to shadow, build relationships over time um, and providing that encouragement and support. It also means that, you know, once you work in a hospital um, to be really mindful of uh, the inequities that happen. Let's say if someone um, doesn't speak English uh, to make sure that every single conversation happens um, with the use of a certified interpreter. I mean, there are things every single day where we see opportunities that we can be more inclusive or we can um, better uh, partner with families and meet their needs. And so I think that work has become much more central. Certainly in pediatrics, where we're always thinking about like, the situation of the family as a whole. Um, but I think medicine is slowly realizing that too. And so I've seen that shift in a very positive way since I've been in medicine. Thanks. And I see a question to jump over to Sarah. Uh, someone has asked again about um, the difference between RN, uh, nurse practitioner. So if you could elaborate a little more on that, what those differences are and what it takes to achieve either position. Sure. Um, so in very, in very basic kind of 
classifications. There's a lot, there's a lot of, there's a lot you can do within nursing, um, kind of um, like Sahar was saying, you can be, you can make the career what you want it to be. Um, but for nursing, you can be a licensed vocational nurse, which is uh, a role that typically has some nursing responsibilities, but not all responsibilities that a registered nurse would have. Usually it's um, a shorter um, education, like an educational program. Um, you don't usually do um, anything that is dealing with blood or IVs or um, higher risk medications. Um, and you also have limited assessment um, required, like uh, expectations of your, of your job. Um, register nurse is uh, kind of opening up your scope a little bit more where you have the assessment piece, you have more responsibility for higher risk medications. Um, and then from, from, and then a registered nurse, you can, you can do all those programs that I uh, referenced earlier where uh, it can be a one-year program, a four-year program, uh, all sorts of avenues to get there and then beyond and then from a registered nurse you can get your bachelor's in nursing um, you can uh, also go on to have a master's in nursing and that's um, people often pursue a master's if it is a uh, a second or second degree or if they if nursing is a second career or if um, their desire is to pursue management or education um, or perhaps a field like public health where you might be working a little bit more autonomously. Um, and then a nurse practitioner is uh, you essentially it's it's you start as a nurse um, and then you go back to school to essentially have a different role. Um, and so that's expanding your skill set even more. Um, you would likely no longer be um, at providing care in the same way, but you have more diagnostic um, and prescribing power. So I would say you work even more closely with the physician side of things um, in terms of uh, in terms of your perspective and your scope. Um, and so it's very, and I mean, you definitely could still work as a bedside registered nurse um, if you did, if you were a nurse practitioner, but usually um, those who pursue their nurse practitioner want more of a, um, want a little bit less of the direct patient bedside care um, and more maybe they want to work in a clinic seeing patients independently or you know working to assess and diagnose patients um, and working more again working more closely with the physician to prescribe uh, diagnose just to throw another career possibility out there there's also a physician's assistant what it, what's the difference in that role from an NP versus a doctor yeah, um, as far as I, as far as my interactions with NPs and PAs go, they often serve very similar, similar roles. Um, they work with, uh, with a physician or with a team. Um, and the physician's assistant is a, the avenue that you can go down if you do not have a nursing background. And so um, I know there, I mean, maybe Sahar, you could speak more to that, but um, there are like patient care hours that you have to have, but you don't have to have a background in nursing. You can, um, you, it requires a college, a college degree uh, study and then some experience after that in patient care, but not necessarily a nursing background. And to be a nurse practitioner, you do have to be a nurse first. Got it. I think Sahar, you've answered a couple other questions there. Um, about going abroad. Uh, okay, so Cameron asked, do you have any information about what it takes to become a labor and delivery nurse? And do you have any experience with that? Um, I, do, I do not, but basic, I don't have experience in that, um, in that role. If I got that job, I would have to be reoriented to the specific needs of that particular population. Um, it definitely is, uh, a different, a different world over there. You're taking care of adult patients as well as newborns. So um, it's, uh, I know it can definitely be a very challenging and very rewarding uh, avenue of nursing. You would, you would pursue that job just as you would pursue any other specialization in nurse. To be an ICU nurse, if you want to be a pediatric nurse, if you wanted um, to be an oncology nurse, you could also go into um, a resident, a nursing residency program at a hospital to be an, uh, an OB nurse. 
And Ellen asked about how can you register to volunteer at Children's Hospital? Um, I think that, you know, I don't know if we're taking volunteers right now due to the pandemic situation happening. Um, but I know if you go to the CHLA website, chla.org, um, they, there should be like a volunteer tab um, where you can see if they have any positions available or needs posted. Oh, Anatoly is now asking, what kind of routes could you take after public health school besides medicine? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so all of these are great questions. So um, you can, if you want to continue doing public health research, um, you can do a PhD, a doctoral degree. Um, and public health itself has multiple subspecialties. So um, I did my master's in um, global health, uh, learning about you know how big health systems work um, in different places. Um, my uh, husband uh, did his in epidemiology, which is basically the the very um, mathematical, um, study intensive, research intensive um, part of understanding um, the risk factors, uh, the determinants of certain conditions. Um, other folks do health services. So you can definitely continue um, education that route. Um, there's a degree called the DRPH or Doctor of Public Health, just to make things confusing. Um, and that's focused more on the practice of public health. Um, and so uh, some of the people I know who have gotten that degree are really invested in community-based work um, and advocacy. Um, and there are plenty of people who after their master's program, um, uh, start working at state uh, departments of health, their internships with the Centers for Disease Control. And so I think it's helpful, um, I mean, to, to do schooling, just to do schooling at some point gets um, very expensive and very tiring. And so there are always opportunities to, um, you know, see what jobs are out there, uh, refine your interests a little bit, and then you can always go back and do further um, schooling if needed. But a lot of people after that master's program go straight into, um, uh, into a job. Thank you. Uh, I see another question about nursing. Is a nursing degree in traditional college the most direct way to become a nurse? Um, in my experience, that was the most direct way. That was the most direct way for me um, because I had um, time and the, I, I was lucky enough to have the financial stability to be able to go straight from high school into a four-year college degree. But um, I know that nursing school is really expensive um, and any, I mean, any sort of secondary education is really expensive. Um, and so uh, for me, that was definitely the most direct way uh, to get from, from point A to point B. But uh, like I said, if you can find these two-year programs, these one-year programs, um, they, they might be a little bit more jam-packed, a little bit more rigorous, but definitely, uh, definitely doable. So I think the last question I see is about um, if you guys are willing to share your contact information, if not, um, uh, Nicolette, you could also email me and I can forward your uh, question on to our guests. So um, yeah, thank you guys so much for taking the time to do this talk today. And oh, there they go. They shared their personal, their information. So, you know, be, be kind, be courteous, but yes, thank you guys for willing to be resources for our youth in the LA and area and beyond. Lynn, do you have any last words? Yes. Um, thank you so much, everybody for just sticking with us today. And of course, uh, since we started our virtual career day program back in April. Um, you know, it's really grown. If um, you guys get the chance, please do take a moment to help us fill out the survey. It'll really help us um, narrow down what, uh, you know, topics we can select for our future career day programs once we start again in January. And uh, any great feedback that you have, we most likely will share it with our guest speakers. And um, yeah, thank you so much, everyone. And then of course, um, we have our Med Talks program that we're going to start again in January as well. So any uh, medical ideas or healthcare topics that you're interested in learning about, we'll search for those uh, guest speakers to bring on those um, topics to all of you. So yeah, thank you so, so much to Sahar and Sarah for being with us today and for sharing 
everything that you know and you know going on in your careers and your career path for our audience members today I'm sure they all appreciate it so much thank you guys my pleasure thanks yeah. for hosting yeah yeah so we'll hang out here um yeah, we'll hang out here for a few minutes and uh, we're going to go ahead and conclude the program.